ask you about Tesla uh, because they had their earnings last night. Uh, they beat, um, you know, the, the, the bears would say they beat because they sold these tax credits and how, how long are these, these credits uh, 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 going to be, you know, a sustainable business model. What do you say? You bought, you, you, you bought into Tesla or bought into the debt a long time ago. I think this is a really important example of a much bigger trend that's happening in the stock market, which is that retail investors now have access to so much information that it's almost on parity with people that work in traditional investment organizations. And what we've seen as that's happened is that the quality of that analysis and the ability to see around the corner is as good and in many cases better than traditional investment firms and the way they view the problem. So from day one, you have had this massive tension between the bulls and the bears on this company. And the bulls basically saw a long-term trend around electrification, and the bears tried to play with balance sheet mathematics. Of course, if I said, you can sell 90,000 cars, but then if you negative sell 100,000, you've not sold 10,000. And you would say, what does any of this mean? You can use any convoluted logic to try to be short this stock, and what you would have done is just lost an enormous amount of money. And so what we're gonna see now is that the stock is gonna become part of the S&P 500. It is the leading edge when it comes to electrification and decarbonization. And here's the thing, Andrew, what the bulls will get right and what the bears will ignore from here is that this is no longer about cars. That that's the first wave of growth, and I think people are pricing in an evisceration of traditional autos and an enormous shift to EVs of which Tesla will get the disproportionate share. So now what is the bet? If you ask me as an investor who loves that company, it was in page four or five of their quarterly earnings release where they talk about the energy business. And they said a couple of interesting things. The first is that it was profitable. And the second is that they're also producing software now that allows effectively anybody to become a distributed utility. Now think of that for a second. You are talking about one of the most predictable, reasonable businesses that have raised hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars of debt. And what Tesla is going to do with their battery packs and their software is all of a sudden allow each of us to be in the energy business as well. Again, people will get angry, they will not understand, they will try to push back, and they will be wrong. And what's gonna happen is that this stock is now going to represent the totality around decarbonization and sustainability. So it was really great to own this thing around cars for the first four years, I did it, I made a lot of money. But now I underwrite this company as a bet towards decarbonization, towards deregulated energy, and towards the ability for all of us to become our little micro utilities. What is that market worth, Chamath? I mean, I ask this because since the end of March, we've seen Tesla add about $200 billion in market cap. So the question is how much of that was captured um, in that run and how much more is there on the energy side of things. And I'm glad you picked on, up on that because I think it was the second thing that Elon Musk said off the top of the conference call. He talked about that business, which really shows you where it is positioned in his mind when it comes to the growth of this company. I mean, to your point, and by the way, the way you frame it is exactly correct. He has been consistently giving us the trail of breadcrumbs to understand this business. He had a quote unquote secret plan that he published on the web. And he updated that secret plan and published it yet again. So all you had to do was just read it and put together a reasonable one or two pager to underwrite the investment. And you know, that's basically what I did. I try to force myself in these big decisions to simplify things versus complexify them. And he told you, by the way, in this earnings release, the next big push is going to be around energy and energy deregulation. So what is that worth? Melissa, this is worth trillions of dollars. And the reason is because if you look at the debt stacks and the earnings potential, and the regulatory framework that has allowed local utilities to thrive, it is measured in hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars. And if individuals can get the solar panels, buy the battery packs, and get essentially free software or low cost software that allow us to collect the sun's energy and redirect it back into the grid, what you're going to see are utilities basically go upside down. And that was the class of debt that people would have told you is completely, completely the safest. And basically would be, you know, guaranteed yield ad infinitum. And I think in the next 20 years, you're gonna see examples where that's not the case. Chamath, let me ask you, to get to the numbers we're at now, you have to, politely, you have to grow into these numbers, right? Uh, and so how much runway 
should an investor be giving? I mean, usually people say the investment community is looking out 12 months, 18 months, maybe 24 months. You know, to make the math on this work, you have to be looking out maybe five years, possibly a decade. Who knows what's going to happen between now and then? I mean, to some degree, I wonder how much you think of Tesla parallels, oddly enough, like a thing like Bitcoin, which I know you, you've talked about over the years, because you have to buy into a really long term vision. So you're talking about something that's really important again for the institutional investor and I think less so for the retail investor. If you give the retail investor a five or 10 year investment horizon, I think many of them will take it because they're not in the business of you know uh, perpetual motion. They're not trying to go in and go out of stocks because they need to earn a management. So I do think it's very simple for people to actually have the discipline and underwrite a 10 year holding period. Now for uh, institutional investors, one thing has changed, which is that rates have essentially gone to zero. And not to get, you know, sort of like arcane in the bowels of financial modeling, but when your risk-free rate is effectively zero, you have to invariably look much further out down, down the line in order to figure out over what period of time will you capture a reasonable amount of earnings. So to your point, Andrew, when rates were at 6%, Investors only needed to look 6, 12, 18 months out. But when rates are zero, you have to be looking out five to 10 years. And I think this is a lot of where the capitulation and frustration by some of the world's best investors have been. They have just refused to internalize the changing of the tactics that have to be employed in a zero rate environment. And for somebody like me, you could say, well, this is a naive tech person who hasn't been an investor over multiple cycles. Maybe that's true. But the one thing that I realized is that when rates are zero, you need to look five to 10 years for growth. And when you do, the reality is that this company has inflected towards multiple markets that are measured in the hundreds of billions and now trillions of dollars. And on a risk adjusted basis, I'd rather own that than a traditional auto OEM right. or a traditional utility. It's just a really good risk parity trade. Shamath, I want to pivot